All right, so with game one in the books, it was time to turn the Mavericks' attention to game two at home. Now, this is important because the Mavericks had not held a 2-0 series advantage since the 2006 NBA Finals when they famously went up 2-0, shenanigans happened and they ended up losing to the Miami Heat in six games. This was a crucial roadblock for Dallas because even the year before when they had been a two seed and lost to the seven seeded Spurs, they actually won game one and then got ridden out of the gym in game two. So this was a big moment for Dallas here. And they came out of it feeling pretty good for the most part because in this game, you have before, first of all, before the game, you have Rick Carlisle kind of joking, hey, the first team to 80 is going to win tonight if game one is any kind of indication. Now, obviously, game one, an 89 81 victory for the Mavericks. Very brutal game until the final six minutes there for Dirk. Even with that being in consideration, his offense didn't necessarily get going. Where he got going and where he took over the game was at the foul line where he went 13 for 13 in the fourth quarter. So based on that, you can kind of look at it and say, well, you know, 18 points, but he gets 13 of those points at the foul line. True, true enough. But the Mavericks had a lot to capitalize on here. This is a much better Portland team. And I, I think I said that in the first video too, but this is a much better Portland team than they get credit for because there is a stretch here at the start of the second quarter where both teams have at least four reserve players in for them. Both teams are deep. In game one, one of Portland's weaknesses was that Wesley Matthews and Gerald Wallace massively struggled in, the, in that game. That would not be the case here in game two. So Dallas had its hands full and as we kind of saw, there was an air of game one in terms of some similar themes. Dirk struggling, but still ultimately delivering a great game. Uh, the offense being sluggish and slow. A great game from Jason Kidd and support from the bench in some key components that they frankly need in order to thrive. Now, I mentioned the slow start in this game, and it is pretty brutally slow for the Mavericks early going because... With like five minutes into the game, Dallas is trailing 7-5. This is a brutal slow pace here. 640 remaining when you finally get a put back from Sean Marion uh, to cut the Portland lead down to two. And yeah, three points more than five minutes into the game is uh, not it, Chief. But they're able to adjust. Dirk starts 0-3, and Portland is the more aggressive team early, but Dallas will not let them really stretch beyond their reach. Portland builds up a lead of about six to eight points, but Dallas stays right there. Conversely, when Dallas is able to flip the script later on and take the lead, Portland, until the very waning moments of the game, never really falls out of striking range. And that's a testament to how good they are as well. But regardless, Jason Kidd's three-point shot is a big part of Dallas's success here. He hit six threes in game one. He ends up with 18 points in game two, with, I think, four three-pointers made. Very, very good shooting from Kidd early on. He even should have had an and one three in the corner, but as he gets, he pump fakes, gets the defender up in the air, and then kind of steps and leans into the foul a little bit, so he's got a toe on the line. It is what it is, but it's a very nice play from Kidd, and his, his level of play was a big part in this repeat Dallas victory, allowing them to seize their first 2-0 series lead since the 2006 NBA Finals. But it's not just Dirk going late and overcoming this. Dirk doesn't have a sexy stat line here. He's 9 of 22 uh, compared to 7 of 20 in the first game. It's not that. It's not the fact that Kidd went from 24 points to 18 points. It's the Dallas bench that is such a difference maker in this game. Peja Stojakovic, 21 points off the bench. He is a big part of the Dallas offense here. They are looking to get him shots and he is knocking them down. It's a major factor in this game. As I said in the last video, Dallas's, Dallas's bench was the highest scoring bench in the NBA that season. And of course, as you would perhaps suspect or per infer, you have Jason Terry leading the league off the bench in terms of his scoring. Although he's only got 10 in this game. It's not a huge jet game, but you know, they need everything they can get because Dirk, in terms of efficiency, is struggling in this game. And they have some foul troubles 
to work through. But you get those three guys basically giving you 20 points a pop. Dirk actually gets you 31, Peja gets you 21, and Kid gets you 18. And that goes a long way. You also start to see real life from J.J. Barea. I mentioned in game one how he was a spark plug and you could see him carving up defenses, getting penetration and kicking out for the open three. That's still there. And despite a very brutal first introduction into this game for J.J. Barea, he does turn the corner in the second half. And you see when he starts to kind of put things together and how he can influence the game in a big, big way for Dallas. But despite Dirk starting just one of six from the field in the first quarter, He's getting good looks. He's just not knocking down the jumper, which for Portland is a little concerning, you have to think, because he hasn't really found his shooting touch in either of the first games, certainly not the first full game and then the first quarter here, but he's still scoring, right? 26 points in game one. He, has, he ends up with a big day here in game two as well, but they're, they're not getting great looks for him, kind of trying to change up what they did in game one. They start throwing Nicholas Batum at him a little bit too much, and Dirk is going at him. He's attacking, getting fouled, getting to the line, and that's a big part for Dallas there because in the last minute and a half of the first quarter, Dallas quickly strings together a 7-0 run that allows them to kind of flip the entire quarter on its head. It had been largely controlled by Portland for about 10 and a half minutes there, and then Dallas flips it on its head behind that, behind some timely scoring, and they were able to stay in it for a little while because Dirk was taking advantage with Batum. He was attacking him, he was aggressive, he was being more physical with him, backing him down in the post, and Portland, trying to adjust to that, was throwing the double team at him, but Dirk passing out of the double team. At this stage, this was the year that it really, really all came together for him. Great at passing out of the double team, the skip pass, cross-court pass, hitting open shooters, helping Peja step right into a three. And it works well because Dallas's ball movement, this is where they were so lethal. If you don't have a guy who can go one-on-one -on -one with Dirk in the post in this situation, and you're gonna have to roll a double team at him, you're dead. You're dead on your feet because Dallas's ball movement and three-point shooting is just too good at this stage. And that's how it works out. So after the first quarter, Portland is shooting 50% compared to 41% for Dallas. Now that's actually before a page of three, but Portland has the edge there. And in fact, that kind of carries into the second quarter as well, where even though I said in the first video, Portland was a team who very much was the slowest pace in the NBA in terms of fewest possessions per game, they kind of tried to beat the Mavericks at their own game in this game. They try to match them in that respect with their up-tempo offense, not so much three-point shooting, but just very quick. You see Portland leaking out and getting a lot of fast break and transition baskets, even after free throws for Dallas, which is inexcusable for the Mavericks. But you do see they tried to meet them kind of on their turf, so to speak. And Dallas actually does a wonderful job in the second half answering that call, but we'll get there. Real quick, another interesting note before we move on from the first quarter. There's a collision between Jason Terry and Wesley Matthews, where Wesley Matthews is strewn out. Looks like he's, I don't know if he's knocked out, but he's clearly jarred. He's not all there. He's laid out on the court. Everyone's crowded around him. They go to a commercial break. When they come back, uh, they basically say like, okay, yeah, he's fine. He's going to return. He's back on the bench. He had gone to the locker room and the broadcast basically has a quote from the sideline reporter essentially saying that he's good to go and that he just passed out for a few minutes on the sideline, but he's good to go now. And I just, I hearing that was kind of jarring because of how seriously we take concussions now. If, if an NBA player today admitted to being passed out or knocked out or whatever, because him and Jet hit head to head, they collided heads. It's the side kind of back of Jet's head with Wesley's face and mouth. Uh, cheekbone area, and if he actually is knocked out, if you say that in today's NBA, not only are you not playing the rest of that game, you might not be playing the next game because you're going to enter concussion protocol and have a lot to do. But Wesley Matthews would return to the game. He would seem mostly fine. It might just be a, a word choice of the time, you know, kind of guys back then would say like, oh, I got my bell wrong, which now is still a warning phrase as well. But it, it's still just kind of a thing where it's like you get knocked and you're a little loopy 
then maybe you feel like you're all right, but you're not necessarily right. So that really stuck out to me, just the difference in culture there and how concussions, how seriously they're taken then versus now. Because even the broadcasters are kind of laughing it off like, oh, see, he just, he was knocked out for a few moments, but he's fine. Let's go, get back in the game, young man. So as I said before, the second quarter starts featuring nine of the 10 players on the floor as reserve players. And I think there's one starter for Portland at the time, but this is really a good showing of the depth of both of these teams. And it's not a good start for Berea here. Uh, he immediately misses a jumper, terrible turnover that leads to a leak out, uh, I think dunk for Gerald Wallace. And he just doesn't look comfortable. He looks like he's forcing the issue. A couple turnovers, a couple fouls, not really fitting well together. Another weird thing, just from a period perspective, looking back at this today in 2020, seeing Patty Mills on Portland, I completely forgot that was a thing. So that was a trip to watch there. But even still, we have a situation where these two teams, a lot of good depth, a lot of talent on both squads. And... Another interesting moment is you actually have uh, Kevin McHale, who is one of the broadcasters here, bring up the Defensive Player of the Year voting. He actually proudly declares that instead of voting for Dwight Howard, the guy who overwhelmingly won it that year, he cast his vote for Tyson Chandler. And he cites the way Tyson was able to change the culture and mindset of the Mavericks, who had always been so offensively focused and very much just try and outscore you in that regard and how he kind of changed that perspective where they become much more of a defensive lockdown team. And even though he struggles in this game with foul trouble, you still see the Mavericks largely do that. Not so much the first half, but in the second half, the Mavericks play some fantastic defense as they really seize control of this game. And even though they can't quite put it away early on, Portland does a great job of staying within six to eight points. They are eventually able to extend that lead in the waning minutes of the game. A big part of what made this Mavericks team so difficult to contend with was not just the outside shooting and ball movement, it was the quality of talent they had up and down the roster. Peja Stojakovic, yeah, he wasn't in his prime by any means. In fact, this was the last team he played for in his career, and he had had back issues that had really sidelined him in the last couple years of his career. But when you can get a guy coming off the bench who he only had six points in game one in like 15 minutes, and then in game two, suddenly he's the second highest scorer on your team, and he's off to the races immediately. Eight quick points in this game compared to six, as I said in the first. And he's just everywhere. He's not just splashing wide open threes. He's baseline pull-up jumpers on dudes. He's getting putbacks at the rim, catching deflections off a tipped pass on a backdoor cut and laying it in. Like, he is everywhere you need him to be. And... <laughs> It, it, it keeps this team in it early on. Jason Kidd's shooting, and he, most of his damage is done in the first half as well. You do start to see him get a little gassed between his big game one and then big game two here. But Jason Kidd's shooting and Peja in this first half really keep the Mavericks in it when Dirk is struggling offensively. He's not finding the basket, in, uh, the bottom of the basket, but he is getting to the foul line. That's a big difference. He didn't shoot any free throws until the fourth quarter of game one. Here he's shooting free throws pretty consistently throughout, and it makes for a big, big difference for this team. Speaking of free throws, I completely forgot to mention in the fourth quarter of the first video of the first game that Dirk had a stretch in March where he made 74 consecutive free throws in the game, in, a, in like the stretch of games there. That's insane. This Mavericks team was very good at converting at the line. Jason Terry, also an 85% three, uh, free throw shooter. Jason Kidd in the mid 80s as well. Yes, interestingly, they do feature the worst free throw shooter in the league that year in Brendan Haywood. And seeing him at the foul line is cringe inducing. He's got a couple free throws right before the half as well. And on one of them, he literally hits the backboard, not the rim. He shoots wide right of the rim and just hits flat on the backboard. Pretty atrocious. I think he's 0-4, but he was something like 34 or 36% on the year, and it's just brutal watching him up there. But this team had a lot going for it. Dirk is one of six in this game shooting in the first half, but he's got seven points, six of six at the line. Uh, you got guys making big plays. I talked earlier about the Jason Kidd corner three. That's big. There's actually an interesting stretch here. So Wesley Matthews 
has a short little run in this game after getting his bell rung in the first quarter where suddenly a Maverick does a big play and he answers. A Maverick does a big play, he answers. You have that Jason Kidd and one near three, not should have been three, but if he had kept his foot back, it would have been a three. Jason Kidd and one in the corner. Wesley Matthews answers with a bucket. In fact, I think it's a three of his own. So Dallas with that kid and one in the corner took its first lead of the game. Wesley Matthews immediately answers with a bucket. Then you get a Dirk and one off of Wesley Matthews and Wesley Matthews comes back and hits a three. Then you get a put back dunk from Tyson Chandler and Wesley Matthews goes back with a bucket. Like it, it's just kind of crazy how suddenly he's everywhere for this stretch. This was as loud as game one was for LaMarcus Aldridge, and he had a, a wonderful game here as well. I want to say he had something like 26 points in this game as well. It's a much quieter 26 points, whereas game one, because he had 11 points in the first quarter, it kind of got off to a thunderous start, and you noticed it. Here, Portland got a lot more damage out of Wesley Matthews, who only had... Wesley Matthews and Gerald Wallace, who were two integral parts of that team, in game one, they were a combined five of 16 shooting. Not the case here at all in game two. Gerald Wallace, who Mikhail keeps calling Crash Wallace. I don't recall hearing that nickname anywhere else. Uh, him and Wesley Matthews, much bigger impact for Portland in this game. And they kind of keep Portland in it because LaMarcus Aldridge is kind of steady hand pacing things, doing the damage you would expect him to do. And then you have the two of them filling the rest of that void. You don't get a whole lot from Rudy Fernandez. You don't get a whole lot from Nicholas Batum in this game. It's just a balanced match. And it keeps this game rather close, despite, you know, you look at these two teams, maybe now on paper, and you think it's more favoring Dallas. But again, Portland was a popular pick by the experts to win this first series. And a lot of that has to do with Dallas's inability to put away not necessarily inferior teams, but teams that weren't, I mean, I guess you would say it that way. I don't know why I'm trying to dance around it. Dallas wasn't able to close out games. Even when they were the superior team, they played down to that level. They lacked that mental fortitude and toughness. And Portland was a gritty team. Nate McMillan's team was very gritty. And that's not just having Marcus Camby there. That's not just having some gritty defensive players there as well. That's just a culture in general. And it really showed. And that's why I think a lot of people probably favored Portland, even though Dallas had the better regular season record, even though Dallas had more, a little bit more depth and better overall offense for sure. They throw out an interesting stat during this game, and that is during the Nowitzki era, the Mavericks are just 3-22 when they fail to score at least 90 points. One of those wins happened to come in game one when they won 89-81. That is pretty impressive in that regard because, one, it tells you the offense was always really good with Dirk. I mean, not like by today's standards, you're like, oh, 90 points, that's an abysmal game. It is, but for a lot of that early aughts and everything, it was kind of a, a paced offense. If you were in that range, if you were in the mid-90s average, then you were at least middle of the running probably. But regardless, it's an interesting stat they throw up there. Then they point out, you know, hey, when Dallas holds their opponents under 90 points, they're 15 and two during that same era. And when both teams are under 90 points, they're three and three, which one in three of those kind of go together. If you're telling me they're, 3-22 and 22 in games in which they score under 90. Well, I'm guessing those three wins are the same three wins I'm looking at when both teams are under 90. But I digress. Uh, that's the data they throw out there during the broadcast on the screen. So I, I thought I'd call attention to that. The first number is the one that was interesting to me. So at the half, Jerk has 14 points. 10 of his 14 points come in that second quarter, but he's still not shooting a great percentage. Regardless, Portland has a 52-50 lead at the half. LaMarcus Aldridge with 16 points on 7 of 11 shooting. Dirk 14 on just 3 of 10 shooting. Portland is winning the field goal battle here. They're winning 51% compared to 45%. Dallas is 4 of 11 from 3. Meanwhile, Portland is 4 of 7. Uh, points in the paint, they're winning as well. Portland is 22 to 20. And bench points is actually where Dallas is already flexing its muscle. It's winning that battle 20 points in the paint for Dallas compared to 11 for Portland. So 
it's been a back and forth battle here, but you see, thanks to guys like Peja stepping up and all that, you see where Dallas is kind of looking like the better team here because Dirk's numbers, 14 is nice, but his shooting percentage hasn't been there. Tyson Chandler's had foul trouble. You haven't gotten anything really out of Jet. And so you look at these different elements and you're like, okay, well, we're within two. We certainly have not played our best yet, but we've gotten a little bit of support from areas where it's very much helpful. Good to know. So I remember at the time watching this, thinking in this position, I felt really good, even though they were trailing at the half, because I felt like, you know, Dirk struggled now through a, you know, a game and a half. He's going to start to find rhythm eventually. And he kind of does with his shooting touch in this second half, but it's still a work in progress through here. Regardless, he's got enough support around him, which years past he did not have, that you kind of get your indication that this team is a little bit of a different animal than we had seen previously. So I mentioned before how Jason Kidd got kind of gassed in this game, actually. You see that during the third quarter here because there's a stretch here where he's just cooking. I mean, he comes out, splashes a three at the start of the quarter on an assist from Dirk. He then gets a pull-up jumper. He rattles off his buckets and he gets to 18 points really early in the second half. But he doesn't score again. And you see him on the sideline. You see him kind of hacking up a little bit, spitting in a cup, putting the towel over his head. He looks a little bit unwell. I don't think it's that he's ill or anything like that. I just think he's flat gassed because he played at a very high level and did a whole hell of a lot in game one. And then in game two, Dallas and Portland suddenly got into a little bit of a track meet, as Kevin McHale said. They were very up-tempo offense. Portland kind of set aside what it likes to do to try and attack Dallas on its front. I don't know how much of that was it look, was McMillan looking at Jason Kidd's effectiveness from game one and the start of game two and just making the determination that, you know what? We're going to try and wear him out. He's a 38-year-old point guard. We're going to make him play this up-tempo pace with us because they're not going to just completely go away on what they do. It's what they do. We're going to try and wear him out a little bit by you know, not letting him rest a little bit more on defense, and we're going to try and run the gas out of his tank and see if anyone else can step up. Well, they did, and it was Peja. But that, that's an interesting development there. You still have Dirk, meanwhile, battling with Wesley Matthews. The two-man game between Dirk and Kidd was grade A, grade A stuff for the Mavericks there. The high post screen, you know, get the mismatch. A lot of times you're getting Dirk then squared up one-on-one -on -one with Wesley Matthews. And Dirk's, Dirk's getting to the line. He's making Wes foul him. He's either drawing an and one off of him or he's getting to the cup. Wes tries to draw the charge, doesn't get it, and Dirk's going back to the line. And Dirk in this game pretty much lived at the free throw line. I mentioned earlier he ends up with 31 points. He's going to do most of that damage at the line because he makes 9 of 22 shots. So he makes up a fair bit of that there. Not necessarily his game one total, but he's getting there rhythmically enough that even though his jump shot at one point in the third quarter, he misses like four straight jump shots, all very makeable, clean looks in his range, just not falling. And you start to see him kind of answering that call. He's finding ways to still impact the game. A couple defensive plays, a deflection on what would have been an easy backdoor layup for Andre Miller on J.J. Barea. Uh, another situation where he actually gets a block on a point-blank layup for LaMarcus Aldridge, just come over or help on that. Fantastic stuff from the Mavericks. You start to see them really tighten the screws defensively. And even though Dirk on the other end isn't necessarily hitting shots, he's still getting the looks he wants. And by getting to the line, he's still helping himself kind of find that rhythm. Now, while he pitched a perfect 13 of 13 at the line in game one, he does not do that in game two. He does miss a free throw. But all the same, he's getting what he, not necessarily what he wants necessarily. Obviously what he wants is a made basket, but he's getting the looks he wants. And even when he's having to quote settle, He's taking the physicality, getting really beat up, guarding, being guarded by LaMarcus Aldridge or Marcus Camby, and he's getting to the line and he's converting. And that's an area of his game where it, it was very much underappreciated, 
I think in a lot of ways. Just the fact that through this entire postseason run, he shot something like 91% from the free throw line. That's how you can continue to impact a game even when your shot is not there. That and of course, uh, you know, setting up your teammates. He gets great looks on his passing out of the double teams, whether it's to Peja, whether it's to Kidd, opens things up a lot for this team. So with these adjustments, Dallas comes out on a 14-5 run to start the third quarter, moving now a lead to 64-57. Even though he's still struggling a little bit, Dirk is, as I said before, you see the defensive screws tighten here. And meanwhile, Peja starts rolling again. He checks in, hits a couple quick buckets. He's sitting at 12 points now on 5 of 7 shooting. Uh, you have a beautiful play design out of, a, out of a timeout here by Rick Carlisle. You get a double pin down for Jason Kidd in the post. Swing pass over to a wide open Peja, who splashes the three, gives him 15 points. He came in the game and it was boom, boom, boom. Three straight looks for him. I think he knocks down two of those three. And it, it sets up well. In fact, they even then get him on the next play down in transition. Another beautiful look from Jet. And he actually bricks that three, but still a very good situation here for Dallas. Dirk at this point is nine of nine at the line. Gerald Wallace, meanwhile, is really answering the call, doing a lot of that dirty work for Portland. He's got 17 points now to his credit. So at the end of the third quarter, you have Dallas leading 73-72. Portland does trim into that lead there, go on a little run at the end of the third quarter. Kind of like how Dallas went on a little run at the end of the first quarter and pull within a single point here. Dirk is sitting with 19 points. Kidd is sitting with 18 points. Dallas, zero turnovers in the third quarter. That is crucial because that's going to continue to play a role here for Dallas. Now it's at this point where J.J. Barea starts to really kick into gear here. J.J. Barea glides through the paint, slides through the defense, and lays it in, in typical J.J. Barea fashion. Interestingly enough, initially Marcus Canby seems reluctant to challenge the shot. I don't understand that because the only thing he could be anticipating is a dump off pass for Brendan Haywood. Regardless, it's weird that he lets J.J. get to the rim multiple times before he kind of changes his dynamic. But at that point, J.J.'s already got it going a little bit. He even hits a jumper a little bit later. And when J.J. Barea has both elements of his game working and he's able to get into the paint at will, things start to happen for the Dallas offense. Good things start to happen for the Dallas offense. And that's what we see because you see fearless J.J. Barea go in there, get clobbered by LaMarcus Aldridge and Marcus Camby, and pop right back up. He's unfazed by the physicality despite him being listed at, depending on what you look at, either 5'11 or 6 foot. There's no way he's either of those. I'm gonna guess he's probably 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, but regardless, this opens things up for the Dallas offense. Peja is still cooking. He knocks down another three to give him 18 for the game. And Dallas, at this point, pulls ahead in bench scoring 29 to 11. So I talked earlier in the second quarter about how, hey, there are nine of the 10 players out there on the floor that are reserves. Look at the depth both of these teams have. Well, clearly one of them is better than the other, and that is the Mavericks squad that can give instant offense off the bench with any number of guys. Jet, obviously, is the sixth man for the, for the Mavericks, and so you're in the situation where it's like the sixth man only has 10 for the game, but this other guy who played only 30-some-odd games with the team is now pouring in 21 points. This is a guy who was almost an afterthought at this point of his career. It didn't even make substantial waves necessarily when he was brought in to the Mavericks, but it just changes the dynamic of certain games in the playoffs. Not the last time you're going to hear Peja's name brought up fondly in this playoff run, but this was the first real Peja gem of the 2011 playoffs. So as I talked about J.J. Barea's offensive impact, he starts doing J.J. Barea things on the defensive end as well. He's drawing charges. He draws, I think, two charges, one from Andre Miller and then one from Wes Matthews. And this allows Dallas to go the other direction and turn that into points. Peja knocks down another three, his fifth three of the game to give him 21 points. And LaMarcus Aldridge at this point, conversely, is sitting at 24. So when you got a guy that is what, like your eighth, ninth man on your team or something coming in and giving you 21 and the other team's showstopper number one option is giving them 24, 
that's pretty significant. Now, obviously, there's a lot more that goes into that equation. I'm not legitimately saying, hey, mono a mono, but at least in terms of the scorecard, that's kind of where you're sitting at that point. So even though Dallas hasn't had much to do in the way of Tyson minutes in the second half, he's still had some foul trouble, the defense has been exquisite. And when Tyson comes in, it gets even better because you see Dallas not only protecting the ball on the other end, at this point, they've stretched beyond 23 minutes without a turnover. None in the second half. I think you got to go back to like the 324 mark of the second quarter uh, to find their last turnover. But you basically get this great sequence where Dallas drives the lane, dump off for Tyson. He misses the initial attempt, gets the offensive rebound, slams it home, rattles the rim, comes back on the other end, and then engineers really anchors this fantastic defensive stand by the Mavericks in which they force a 24 second violation. That is premier defensive ability here because Portland is desperately trying to get it and Dallas is just smothering for this possession and it's a critical swing moment in the game because from this point on, Dirk goes into full closer mode. How badly did things go for Portland in the fourth quarter? Well, Dallas was shooting 7 of 14 from the field compared to just 3 of 5 at that point for Portland. And then Dirk turned it on. Like, it is incredible how they were able to dominate for that. Dallas goes up 10 with 250 left. Dirk moves to 26 points at that point in the game. He ends up then going all the way to 31 points on 9 of 22 shooting. Again, he was 7 of 20 in the first game. So Dallas goes up 2-0 for the first time in a series since 2006 despite the fact that Dirk did not shoot well in either game, despite the fact that the other team played very good defense on the Mavericks. Like, they kept them just barely over 100 points, and for a little bit there, there was a lot of question on if they were even going to get there. They were held below 90 in the first game. There was some question that they wouldn't make it to 100 in this game for a little while there until Dallas started to turn it on. So in the second half, Dallas has zero turnovers. Zero turnovers for like a 27 minute stretch. They go on this run to close it out. Dirk is doing Dirk things. He's starting to knock down a couple jump shots. He's still getting to the line. Misses one in the game. I think he's, I don't remember how many he attempted overall. I wanna say he was something like 12 of 13 in this game from the stripe. But Dallas ends up grabbing a 101-89 victory. This is exquisite, the start for this series for Dallas. But it's not the end of the adversity because as we're going to see in game three and especially four, Portland's not done. Portland came into this series having not won a playoff series since the year 2000 and they are not about to go quietly. 48 wins is still 48 wins in the Western Conference and they were ready to put up a hell of a fight. Dallas, if they were going to overcome their demons of the past, were going to have to show a lot of grit and toughness, even beyond what they did in the first two games. So that concludes my wrap-up of Game 2 of the first round of the Western Conference Finals. Three-seeded Dallas hosting the six-seeded Portland Trail Blazers. We will continue this in a couple days now with Game 3, and we'll continue through the entire 2011 Mavericks playoff run. But... Until next time, don't forget to like this video, drop a comment below, buy the merchandise at represent.com. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.